1822. Using the recently discovered Rosetta Stone as a key, European scholars are finally able to decipher the hieroglyphic inscriptions on the statues and tomb walls that archaeologists have been uncovering in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Finally able to identify the ancient kings and pharaohs. But one is a puzzle. A pharaoh depicted like all the other pharaohs as male, but identified in inscriptions as a woman. This was Hatshepsut. She had come to the Egyptian throne around 1493 BC as the wife of the pharaoh Thutmose II. When he died, power passed to his nephew, Thutmose III, only a child at the time. Hatshepsut was named regent to handle government affairs until Thutmose III was old enough to rule. Hatshepsut was regent for seven years, then did something unprecedented. In 1479 BC, the queen declared herself king. Officially, she and the still young Thutmose III were co-rulers, but in practice, Hatshepsut was pharaoh. To establish her authority, Egyptologists say Hatshepsut adopted the full insignia and regalia of a pharaoh, including fake beard, headdress, and kilt. To show that she was strong enough to intervene with the gods on her subjects' behalf, Hatshepsut often had herself depicted as a muscular male. Hatshepsut also did what previous pharaohs had done. She built great monuments, including a huge memorial temple to herself, Deir al-Bari, one of the architectural wonders of the ancient world. Part of it can still be seen today. So can one of the two red granite obelisks Hatshepsut installed at the Temple of Amun in Karnak. Like her fellow pharaohs, Hatshepsut also expanded Egypt's reach and power, not with military campaigns, but through trading and commerce. She sent an expedition to the land of Punt, what some historians believe is now Ethiopia or Eritrea. The ships returned with ebony and ivory, gold, leopard skins, incense, and myrrh trees. Hatshepsut ruled Egypt as pharaoh for 20 years of relative peace and prosperity. She died in early 1458 BC. DNA testing is being done on a mummy identified as Hatshepsut's, but the cause of her death is unknown. So are the reasons for this, the deliberate smashing and defacing about 20 years after her death of her statues, her images, and inscriptions that mention her. All were destroyed on orders of her nephew Thutmose III, who succeeded Hatshepsut as pharaoh. Early Egyptologists saw the destruction as the new pharaoh's jealous act of revenge against a power-grabbing ant. More recent scholars think Thutmose III was trying to rewrite history to show an unbroken line of male pharaohs, to secure succession for his own son, and remove any public record that might inspire other women to seek the pharaoh's throne. No woman in the ancient world would equal Hatshepsut's power and achievement till Cleopatra, 14 centuries later. Charlie Bay, of course, on Queen Hatshepsut, of course, very famous female pharaoh of the uh, New Kingdom. So, kind of talk about that later, of course, today, uh, wrapping up, of course, ancient Egypt this week. So, Hey, welcome you back, Daniel Simon at BRCC. I uh, hope everybody had a great weekend uh, overall. Uh, yeah, this week we will be, of course, like I said, wrapping up Egypt because I am, of course, getting to, of course, another assessment coming up, which, you know, it's first exam, which I have been working on over the weekend. Uh, so I'll kind of talk about that a little later, uh, that assignment coming up. But it uh, looks like right now, I know live, I've got a few students watching. Uh, looks like Tristan, hey, joined us. Few minutes ago. Good morning. Uh, hey, what's up, Tristan? Also, Marissa. Hey, what's going on this morning uh, as well? Uh, Becky. Good morning. Also, uh, Alex. Hey, what's up? Uh, and also, looks like Jeremiah is joining us as well, along with, uh, of course, Sierra. Also. So uh, anyway, um, kind of talk about a few reminders before I get going today with our main lecture. 
Uh, yeah, I am. I got like that uh, quiz on uh, Mesopotamia still up. I did leave it open a couple days. Uh, so that that is going to close on Wednesday uh, because uh, I am going to have, of course, like I said, a new assessment coming up. I will have, uh, which will open on Wednesday this week, uh, which will be the first exam. Uh, that, of course, like I said, it's going to be on ancient Egypt. Uh, pretty much the whole three lectures I had on that, which is, the, of course, the last one I'm working on the day. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll have a review later for you, which i uh, not sure when I'll post it, either today or tomorrow, uh, which will be like a first exam re review on ancient Egypt, uh, which will be recorded. Uh, but I do have an extensive study guide I kind of developed for that, uh, for, you, for help you review uh, for that upcoming assessment, of course, uh, which, like I said, I'll post this week, uh, likely Wednesday. So kind of just talking about that, what's coming up. Uh, with different assignments. I know y'all do have like the first vocab assignment due later uh, next week, I think at the end of next week, uh, which is right before I think Mardi Gras uh, comes in after that, because I know Mardi Gras is coming up holiday, I know in a couple weeks. Uh, looks like also Christian is also joining us uh, as well this morning. Say what's up, Christian, uh, as as well. So anyway, get to, of course, uh, talk about the main thing today, which is last lecture, of course, on ancient Egypt. Uh, like I said, today I'll primarily talk about, I'll kind of go into the Middle Kingdom a little bit. I don't usually cover that much into it, but I'll kind of go into some detail, uh, which is kind of a weaker state, uh, you know, that's kind of between the Old and New Kingdoms. And of course, I'll get the main thing today. Uh, we'll talk about the New Kingdom, which uh, the New Kingdom really uh, is the peak period of ancient Egypt. Uh, it's when they were largest as an empire. Uh, we'll talk about that and kind of go into maybe why they declined a little bit afterwards as well. So if you have any comments, questions, of course, uh, about the live stream or, or anything, of course, uh, let me know, of course, during, during the lecture. Or you can always leave comments on my channel or also uh, on Canvas discussions uh, online as well. So uh, anyway, uh, let me go ahead and talk about, of course, the background of, of the Middle Kingdom. I'll get, kind of get into that first, uh, and then we'll get into uh, the New Kingdom. But here, here's that, of course, again, the different kingdom periods of ancient Egypt. You remember, we talked about the Old Kingdom already, which was the peak period of, of Egypt when they built the bulk of the greatest pyramids, like the Giza pyramids, uh, were constructed. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we'll also talk about the Middle Kingdom uh, in the New Kingdom. But they think that the Old Kingdom collapsed, they think, around the 22nd century B.C., uh, which led to what they call the First Intermediate Period, uh, which was a period of decline and chaos uh, in Egypt. There's different theories on why that happened, but uh, they seem to think that it was caused by massive droughts and famines uh, throughout Egypt. And Egypt broke up uh, at one point. Uh, and so you get this new state that comes in, uh, which is called the Middle Kingdom, uh, which is right here. Uh, the Middle Kingdom is kind of a weaker state uh, that mostly has predominantly, it's got predominantly uh, two major dynasties that are in it, the 11th and the 12th dynasties. Sometimes they throw in the 13th and the 14th ones uh, as well. But those are the two peak uh, dynasties they had with the 12th dynasty being the one that's really considered, I think, the most famous one uh, of that particular period. i kind of show you this, but uh, they had different pharaohs that were part of the uh, Middle Kingdom. Uh, Mentu Hotep II, of course, was a famous ruler, sixth king of the 11th dynasty. Uh, they think he's the one that reunited Egypt, where he took the upper and lower parts of Egypt and combined it. I think they, they theorized that part of why uh, the capital of Egypt starts to shift down toward the southern part of Egypt is because they, they think that a lot of the earlier rulers of like the 11th dynasty came out of like, um, I think they think they were no marches or, or some kind of rulers of the southern part of Egypt and they seized power and then the base of Egypt kind of shifted more to the southern part uh, or upper Egypt. But they think under the 11th dynasty that the capital of Egypt starts to shift down more towards the south uh, where Thebes is, which now is modern Luxor uh, in Egypt today. So there's Mentu Hotep, the second famous ruler 
Uh, I think they have like three rulers of that name uh, during the 11th dynasty. Of course, there is uh, the ancient ruins of Karnak, the Karnak Temple Complex, which uh, really most was built during the New Kingdom later. But that temple supposedly was the largest temple ever constructed uh, in, in, in the world. I think it's like 250 acres uh, in size. Uh, and it became the um, cult center of the god Amun, which was like a state god of Egypt. And, uh, of course, the ruins of it are now in modern Luxor, uh, in, of course, southern upper Egypt uh, today. Uh, that's, they think, maybe how it, how it looked like uh, the Karnak Temple Complex, which, which they think was built by successive pharaohs uh, between the 18th and the 19th dynasties. Uh, but it was a massive complex. I'll get to it later, but the most famous part of it was the hypostyle hall uh, that had like 70 foot columns in it that held up the roof. Uh, and it was built by several rulers, including uh, Ramses the Great. Uh, here's another ruler they had too uh, that was part of the 12th dynasty. His, his name was Emanemet the first. There was actually three rulers uh, with that name, Emanemet the first, second, and third. And uh, they consider this period, that, like I said, the peak rule uh, of the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, because uh, during that time, Egypt began to expand. So they you know, controlled lower and upper Egypt. Uh, and then from there, it's believed that the Egyptians began to push down into like northern Sudan uh, in an area that they called either Nubia or I think another name that the Egyptians called it was Kush uh, as well. And uh, and we have the first, second, third rulers like that uh, were considered uh, some of the last major rulers that really built uh, pyramids, at least large sized pyramids uh, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, they also built canals. That's some most people don't know about with the Middle Kingdom. But during that time period, uh, the Egyptians began, began building uh, canals uh, to connect Egypt uh, with different parts of that region. Uh, and uh, there was a, a pharaoh you see there named Senusret uh, I, uh, who in the 19th century built several canals. Uh, he built one you see there on the right, uh, which is called the Canal of the Pharaohs, uh, which connected uh, the Nile Delta uh, to the Great Bitter Lake, and then it ran into uh, what is the Red Sea, uh, where it says Lower Egypt to the right of that. Uh, that was one. They also built another canal that connected uh, the Nile River to Fayum, which is that oasis. And that's kind of to the uh, west of the river uh, next to his statue. And they, uh, supposedly they built another canal that connected like the Nile River to like where the first cataract was or something like that in that area. Uh, and so, yeah, Egypt is kind of famous for having canals back then. Uh, they do think that the canal was kind of, not, they're not sure if it was completed or not. Uh, they do think that other states came in, like the Persians tried to kind of continue it, and other powers later tried to build canals. And of course, more recently, the 20th century, uh, of course, the Suez Canal was also constructed, uh, which connects the Mediterranean Sea to, of course, the Red Sea today. Uh, Imanel III, uh, he's like one of the peak rulers, they think, uh, of the Middle Kingdom. Uh, he's part of the 12th dynasty. And uh, he built actually one of the last major pyramids, uh, which is called the Black Pyramid. It's called that because of the fact that the pyramid, um, like its ruins is kind of a dark blackish color. Uh, hence, it's got its name. And it was built at uh, Dashur, I think I told you about, where the Red Bent Pyramid was where were built before. Uh, and um, about 20, 30 miles to the south of uh, of of um, Cai Cairo, <clears throat> and um, it's an interesting pyramid because um, it's about 250 feet tall. So it's about one of the largest pyramids, like one of the last ones that real tall like that. I guess that's constructed. Uh, but it's an interesting pyramid because it's got not just his uh, chamber put in it, like barrel chamber, but also like his queens were put in it, which is something they don't do much, of course, in ancient Egypt, but uh, they did actually do that. So it's something kind of unique. Uh, about Imhotep the third, uh, you know, with his pyramid, but like one of the last major pyramids to be constructed in Egypt, the so-called Black Pyramid uh, that they have as as well. So that's the peak period of, of course, of the Middle Kingdom. Uh, they do think there was like maybe the 13th, 14th is sometimes included also 
uh, in the period of the Middle Kingdom, but sometimes they put that in the second intermediate period, uh, which comes after as well. That's what I want to get into today, the main thing, which is I want to talk about the New Kingdom period, which uh, the New Kingdom, I'll get to it later, has three dominant dynasties that are part of it later, uh, the 18th, uh, the 19th, uh, and the 20th dynasties. It kind of comes comes at the end of the Bronze Age, the late Bronze Age. And um, they think that the New Kingdom uh, emerged because of a threat where Egypt got invaded. Uh, they had these peoples uh, that were called the Hyksos uh, that invaded Egypt around the 17th century. Uh, you kind of see uh, an image of, of that on the right uh, with, I guess, the Hyksos coming in. And uh, they do think it kind of... Uh, it, it, in the 1600s, uh, they theorized that these peoples came out of um, what is basically the Levant. I think there's a theory that the Hyksos were some kind of um, Asiatic peoples uh, that came from like where Canaan is, which would be like where Israel uh, and maybe Lebanon is. They might be similar to the Israelites. It's kind of debated how they're related. Some people think they may, may have been related to them, but they're not sure if that's true or not, uh, from different sources a long time ago. Uh, what we do know uh, is that they have different sources that write about uh, the uh, Hyksos. Uh, the main source that's important is Manefo. Who, uh, who was Manefo? Uh, Manefo was this um, kind of like a Greco-Egyptian priest uh, who was an historian that lived about the 3rd century B.C. Uh, he lived under the Ptolemaic dynasty. Maybe under King Ptolemy the first, he was one of the first rulers of that kingdom that reigned over Egypt. Who we were related back to the Macedonians, and after Alexander had conquered Egypt, uh, and uh, he was the main source. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, e "History of Egypt," or if you want the Greek version, it's "Egyptica." I think it's how I say it in, in the in the Greek. Uh, and um, the only thing about his work is that it's now in fragments through. Uh, Flavius Josephus, uh, who was a uh, Roman Jewish writer uh, that lived about 2,000 years ago in the late 1st century AD. And so he's our main source on it. And they, they say Josephus is the one that kind of tried to connect maybe uh, the idea of the Hyksos being related to the Israelites, uh, but they're not sure if that's true or not. Uh, what we do know about the Hyksos, uh, they introduced a lot of things to Egypt, like the horse and chariot were brought in, which you see in that image uh, on the right. Uh, so they brought that in from, I guess, Mesopotamia uh, to the east, where probably they started fighting uh, with horses and chariots. Sickle sword, uh, which they had in, uh, in Mesopotamia, and probably the Hittites had it uh, also as well. And the composite bow uh, was also something uh, they were able, they also brought in. And that totally changed warfare uh, in Egypt. Uh, and it allowed them to take control of the northern part of Egypt that we call Lower Egypt, but they never conquered the southern part or Upper Egypt. They actually had a capital at Averis. That was their capital uh, where they reigned from. And I think there's stories where I think they say that they a lot of the, of course, a lot of them had like their own dynasties and pharaohs, uh, but they had a chief god they worshipped, which was the god Set, which was like a desert god. So it's kind of interesting that these were maybe desert peoples at one point that came in and just seized control uh, of Egypt, but they're not considered native Egyptians, at least they think. Uh, they're kind of seen as foreigners. And uh, according to Manetho, uh, he was the you know the writer on it. He said that the word Hyksos meant something like rulers of foreign lands. So it's kind of what it meant. Or some people say foreign kings or something like that uh, is the translation of it. So anyway, that's kind of talking about the Hyksos uh, and who they, they of course, were. So that that brings in, of course, a new period, of course, in uh, Egypt we'll get to. Uh, we're going to, of course, talk about the, you know, the new kingdom that comes in next, that, you know, seizes power uh, at that point. Uh, here's kind of an image showing you, of course, the uh, period, of course, of Egypt. Yeah, it's a golden age, of course, of Egypt uh, that we have. Uh, you can see it peaks 16th to 11th centuries B.C., uh, it's really the most famous period uh, in ancient Egypt because really they know more, more about this period uh, and the pharaohs that reigned over it 
uh, than anything. Uh, so you have all these different pharaohs we'll kind of talk about. Amos the first. Uh, you got the, all the Tutmos, uh, Tutmosis type pharaohs that reign. I think they had four of them. One, two, three, and four. Ramses the second, of course. Uh, they have later, who's part of the 19th dynasty. Uh, also, you got King Tut, Tutting, Tutting Common, of course, also reigning. Uh, Amenhotep the fourth, or Akhenaten, of course, Hatshepsut from that you know little video. Of course, we saw earlier. Also, Queen Nefertiti. Uh, we'll also talk about her uh, as as well. Uh, they considered this particular ruler, Amos the first, to really be the first, really the founder of the 18th dynasty. Uh, he had a brother named Kamos. They talk about Amos and Kamos. I think Kamos was the kind of like one of the last rulers of the 17th uh, dynasty before that. And it was really those two uh, rulers that drove the Hyksos out, like out of Egypt, and drove them back into the Levant, uh, to the east. And afterwards, he formed the new the new kingdom with the 18th dynasty. Uh, and so you can see his reign was sometime in the 16th century or mid to late 16th century when he lived. And so they would go on, like I said, the new kingdom would have three dynasties, uh, the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th dynasties. Uh, they do have nicknames for them. Uh, a lot of times the 18th dynasty was sometimes called the Tutmosid dynasty or Tutmosids because uh, you have all these rulers named Tutmos or Tutmosis, uh, one through four, I told you. And then uh, the 19th and the 20th dynasties are sometimes called the Ramesid dynasties or Ramesids because uh, you have all these rulers that have the name Ramses. Uh, I think 11 of them at one point. It was because they uh, put a lot of uh, emphasis on the god Ra again, uh, the sun god of Egypt. A uh, period marked by expansion and empire in the Near East, which is true about that. And then also they were known for having a lot of extensive temple building, which a lot of that was done uh, in Upper Egypt, like at Karnak and mortuary temples that were constructed also in Western Thebes across from Luxor where Thebes was. There's Amos, of course, on the right. Uh, here's a map showing you the New Kingdom. It's like an empire, really. Uh, and you can see how the empire stretches from, like, uh, Egypt, part of Libya, and Sudan. And then it goes into the Sinai, you can see, and up into, like, where Israel, Lebanon, and part of Syria is. So basically a Near Eastern empire that's in part of Africa and part of Asia uh, and it's really the peak period of the empire. I think 15th century to the 13th century is usually considered the peak of the new kingdom in its size. Uh, of course, here's another pharaoh I'll kind of mention about real quickly, but Tutmos I, he was the third pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. Uh, he's the one where they get the name Tutmosids, I guess, for the actual dynasty because of all the different pharaohs that, that came later. Uh, but he's very famous for being the first pharaoh that was actually buried uh, in the Valley of the Kings, I guess KV-1, I guess they would call it. And uh, you can see that at one point there were 62 tombs that were actually cut into the bedrock of the Valley of the Kings. They built these rock-cut tombs, uh, which were designed to hide, hide their mummies and th their treasure that they were buried with uh, there. And the only problem was the tomb robbers knew where all the tombs were, and so they went back and robbed them. And so out of the 62 tombs, 61 out of the 62 were all robbed, uh, except for the last one they found, King Tut's tomb, of course, found in 1922, is the only one that was found mostly intact. I think they end up finding, like, most of the mummy, like, a lot of the mummies, I think 22 of the mummies, actually, that's how many it was, uh, but most of their treasures were all robbed a long time ago. Uh, now, one of the um, main uh, pharaohs I'm going to get to today, of course, is talk about Queen Hatshepsut, uh, considered one of the most famous uh, female rulers uh, of ancient Egypt. Uh, she wasn't supposed to be pharaoh. Uh, if you know about, uh, they had talked about her in that little short video. Uh, she was actually the daughter of Tutmos I, the one that I told you about that had started the Valley of the Kings. And um, what happened was... Uh, Tutmos I had a son named Tutmos II who reigned, but he died young, like only oh, reigned like a few years, they think, a short reign. 
And so after after uh, Tutmos II died, uh, Tutmos II had a son named Tutmos III, and he was supposed to be the ruler, but he was like an infant, I think, at the time, like very young. And so she basically took power uh, as Pharaoh in in his place, uh, which I think was his nephew. Uh, and um, longest reigning female Pharaoh, I think she reigned something like 20, 21 years uh, as, as Pharaoh. And I do think that her reign was kind of like a golden age of Egypt, like a peak of Egypt uh, at the time. <clears throat> and um, and see, there's a bunch of things she's known for. Uh, she did expand trade uh, throughout Egypt. If you go back to that map uh, that I was showing you uh, a second ago, which is right here, uh, she did supposedly expand a trade down to like the eastern part of Africa, like the Horn of Africa, uh, down there, I guess, below the Red Sea there, a place called Punt, I think it was called, which Punt was like an area like close to where Somalia is uh, today in Ethiopia. Uh, and so they think that Egypt was starting to trade uh, with those areas uh, right there uh, at the time. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, also um, they think that she, under her reign and her nephew, uh, later, uh, they began to also expand Egypt, like into Nubia, like into Sudan, uh, and then also pushing into the Levant, uh, into like where Canaan and Syria. So all that uh, starts to, of course, be uh, something that uh, under her reign that occurs and under her nephew uh, as well. And um, that all happens around the 15th century when all these conquests are starting to happen and expansion of the new kingdom. Uh, she's also known for her building projects. The uh, most famous thing, of course, she constructed, if you know about this, uh, is her mortuary temple, uh, which was built at uh, Deir al Bari, as they call it, which is in western Thebes, across from where modern Luxor is today. Usually called the Temple of Hatshepsut. Uh, it was a type of uh, temple that was constructed, a uh, very futuristic type uh, uh, statues and columns that were part of it with multi-leveled, you know, type temple. Considered one of the greatest temples ever built uh, in uh, ancient Egypt. And it was constructed primarily to honor her reign, but also the god Osiris uh, as well, you know, the god of the dead or, or, or the king of the dead. And uh, supposedly there was this architect that constructed it named Senemut, uh, who was very close to her and her family, uh, there's even speculation that they may have been lovers because uh, her husband had died. Uh, so he's the one that kind of constructed it. And since, since I think, modern times, uh, if you know about it, they did, they reconstructed it like back in the 20th century. And so that's kind of what they think it looked like uh, a long time ago. And it's got the causeways that kind of run up to the different levels of it, uh, you can see. Uh, here's another image, of course, of the Temple of Shepsut uh, right there. Uh, she also built um, like part of the Karnak Temple Complex, which I'll talk about. And there's a uh, she built like like a huge obelisk uh, was constructed there, which uh, I think it was like 90 feet tall. And it was like 340 something tons uh, in, in weight, uh, the size of it. Uh, so she was she was known for her building projects, of course, but. The only thing about Hatshepsut, uh, they think I'll get to it later. Her, her nephew, if you know about that, Tutmos the Third would take over when she would die. They're not sure how she died. That's been kind of a mystery. Uh, they haven't been able to figure out. Uh, they do think that her mummy was found in 1903 by Howard Carter in the Valley of the Kings. They think they do have her mummy, uh, but they're not sure the cause of death. But they believe what happened was after uh, she uh, died. Uh, her her nephew came in and tried to erase her uh, from history. Uh, they, I think they even had a deal where they buried her statues and stuff like that to kind of erase her because they didn't want a female. I guess nobody knowing there was a female ruler uh, at one point. So that's that's who had Shepsut was, of course, uh, with that uh, with her her reign. Now let me get to another pharaoh. Kind of briefly talk about, of course. Uh, which is Tutmos III. We were kind of talking about him. Uh, sometimes he's kind of overlooked as a pharaoh because of, I guess, Queen Hatshepsut, uh, her reign uh, and all that. But uh, he was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, uh, son of Tutmos II, uh, of course, and they think a nephew of Hatshepsut, which I think they also say he's like a step stepmother 
of course, uh, also to Tutmos the third uh, as well. I actually reigned a long time, like 1479 to 1425 was how long he was pharaoh. But part of those years were, were where his his aunt, you know, Hatshepsut, kind of ruled uh, over over the uh, the empire, uh, and. Um, he is considered one of Egypt's greatest conquerors. Like, like supposedly later, they I think the British kind of gave him a nickname, which is the Napoleon of Egypt because of all his great conquests, uh, where he expanded Egypt. Uh, I think he completed the conquest of Nubia uh, to the south uh, in Sudan. I think the Egyptians got as far as Khartoum, uh, which is one of the main cities, of course, in, in Sudan today. And it, it did expand, of course, up into where Syria is. Uh, also, so Thutmose the uh, Third, you know, is one of these kind of rulers that is kind of overshadowed uh, as a monarch, but might have been one of the greatest male, you know, you know, male figures like pharaohs that really reigned uh, over Egypt uh, during that period. I think him and Ram- him and Ramses the Great uh, were probably known for a lot of their military exploits and things like that. And whether he was short like Napoleon, I think they have his mummy. They found. He might have been short too. <laughs> I think the boy wasn't really short. He was average height, you know, for that time period. Yeah, yeah. They, so he's the one that probably finished the conquest, you know, like expanding, of course, the empire. Uh, let me spend some time on this other pharaoh that was part of the 18th dynasty uh, that was well known. You have Akhenaten, who was originally known as Amenhotep IV, uh, who was a ruler that reigned uh, in about the mid 14th century. Uh, this particular pharaoh was controversial because of religious changes that he made uh, to Egypt uh, at the time. Uh, There he goes right there, uh, of course, on the left, 1352 to 1336 B.C., uh, when he reigned. So it was not not a very long reign. He was in power. Uh, He was the son of Amenhotep III, uh, who was a kind of a ruler that was pretty good as well, uh, ancient ancient Egypt. Uh, But what he was known for, Akhenaten, was that he was very famous for creating this cult uh, that was based around a, a god called Aten. Aten was this type of um, god which went, they think, went back to the Old Kingdom. Um, and uh, they believe uh, Aten was like often called the sun disk god. And um, he wanted to take that god and supplant the supremacy of the god Amen. You know, have that as the main kind of god. Uh, that everybody uh, would worship. And so Akhenaten uh, was later called the heretic because of these radical changes uh, that he made uh, to Egypt. In fact, if you know about the Egyptians, struck him from the uh, list of royal kings, the kings of Egypt uh, that they had. And the Aten cult, sometimes called Atenism, uh, was kind of a brief period where he tried to convert Egypt to this one one main god, uh, etc., so what he did was he changed his name, uh, which um, uh, Amenhotep IV was the original his name. He changed his name to Akhenaten, which means the living spirit of the Aten. He's now worshiping this god instead of the god Amen, which the other pharaohs have been worshiping mostly uh, at that time. And then he did something else, if you know about that. He also moved the capital. The capital was mostly like a Thebes. Uh, and so the cult center changed from Thebes uh, to a new site, uh, which was called Akhetaten. Uh, Akhetaten uh, was an ar- is an archaeological site that's kind of uh, located halfway between Cairo and Luxor today. So kind of like the Middle Egypt or central part of Egypt. And he began constructing a city there, uh, which took about maybe about 10 years, which was mostly made of mud brick. And uh, the na- supposedly the name Akhetaten meant Horizon of the Aten, where he would worship uh, this god, uh, but obviously this this period was often it was often called the Amarna period because because you know the, his reign was pretty much from there and King Tut briefly reigned from there too before he moved the uh, capital back to of course uh, what would be Thebes again, uh, but he was kind of a radical pharaoh. Uh, there's a lot of images of him where he looks kind of uh, grotesque looking, like very ugly. Uh, some people think that may have been caused by inbreeding, though, uh, in in the you know the Egyptian royal family. But supposedly, how the cult worked was that uh, everybody would worship the pharaoh, 
because the Pharaoh is supposed to be like a living God, and then he would worship the god Aten. That's how it actually worked, supposedly. Uh, there he is with, of course, uh, his family. Uh, if you know about Akhenaten, he was famous for his wife, uh, which was Queen Nefertiti. Uh, queen Nefertiti, by the way, uh, was considered to be the most beautiful queen of Egypt. Uh, it meant uh, the beautiful one uh, has come. Uh, and um, if you know about her, uh, there's theories that she may have reigned briefly after her husband died. Maybe not quite three or four years. Two to four years, I think, might be the range of how many years she may have reigned uh, when he died. She reigned from Akhetaten too. Uh, and uh, what became very famous about her uh, is the Nefertiti bust that they later found. You see in the center on the left, uh, found in 1912 uh, by German archaeologists. Uh, and we know about the Nefertiti bust. It's the most famous Egyptian artifact probably ever found. Uh, it's been replicated by a lot of people, of course. And it's controversial, too. Uh, if you know about it, it's actually uh, not in Egypt. It's in Germany. Like in Berlin, uh, there's a uh, there's a museum there called the Neuss, Neuss Museum. That's where it's actually held uh, in, in, in Germany. And so, yeah, there's a lot of controversy about it because a, a lot of the Egyptians want it to be repatriated back to, you know, uh, Egypt, uh, just like the Rosetta Stone, et cetera. Uh, then, of course, uh, one of the most famous pharaohs, you know, of the 18th dynasty is Tutankhamun, of course, known as, of course, King Tut, uh, who would reign next. Uh, after Akhenaten and Nefertiti uh, died. Uh, he reigned, you can see, at the end of the 14th century of B.C. Uh, you can see that he's the 11th pharaoh of, of the 18th dynasty. By the way, he was one of the last major pharaohs, at least direct descendant of the 18th dynasty pharaohs, because uh, there's like two more that reigned afterwards, which were not related to him. He was, they think now, from DNA tests that they they've done. They do think he's the son of Akhenaten, who I just talked about. Uh, and uh, his original name was Ak uh, Tutankhaten. Now, that's actually what he called himself or what he was called uh, originally. Uh, and uh, he reigned briefly from what is Akhenaten. And then under his reign, he moved the capital back to, of course, Thebes. Uh, King Tut, you know, is known for his young reign. Uh, they theorize that he reigned for a little less than 10 years, um, maybe around the age of nine. There's a debate about when he died, though. 18, 19, maybe could have been the age of when, when he died. And so that got him the nickname, the Boy King. Some people call him the Golden King because uh, of his, you know, gold death mask, uh, etc. And uh, they do think that probably a lot of his ministers under him were the ones that really controlled the throne when he was really young. They're the ones that probably moved the capital back to Thebes uh, more than anything. And they restored the traditional cults that Aka, Akhenaten had tried to get rid of. Uh, now, there's a lot of theories about him. If you know about King Tut, he's really more famous for being dead. He really is. Like his tomb, his tomb that they find on 1922, uh, by Howard Carter was really the most famous thing that that ever was discovered in Egypt. Uh, considered one of the greatest discoveries probably in the 20th century, archaeological wise. Uh, there's been a debate about how he died. Uh, there's two theories: one that he died of natural causes, which they think that might be more true uh, than anything. Which apparently uh, he may have suffered from a lot of uh, ailments because of the, all the inbreeding was within the actual, you know, royal family. Uh, they say he suffered from malaria, a club foot, uh, epilepsy, and they think he also may have had some kind of accident where he fractured his foot, uh, which they think that might have been the real cause of death, which may have caused gangrene that set in and he died uh, afterwards. There's another theory he was murdered. Because uh, they think right afterwards, uh, there was a pharaoh that comes in named uh, A uh, that sees, in fact, the two, the two pharaohs that take over afterwards uh, are A and Horemheb. And there's a theory that some, some historians, Egyptologists, have theorized that 
A, may have had it murdered, uh, take power, but they're not sure if that's really true or not. I think those were generals and ministers that were under uh, King Tut. Uh, but like I said, King Tut's his tomb had been lost for years. Nobody could find it, uh, of course, until 1922. Uh, there's the man, of course, who found King Tut's tomb, Howard Carter. Uh, he was, of course, a very famous uh, British ar archaeologist, Egyptologist, uh, who had been in Egypt since the late 19th century. He'd done a lot of archaeological uh, digs there. Uh, I think they say he's the one they, they think found uh, the mummy of Hatshepsut Hap, Hap, I, I told you about uh, earlier. And um, here are some other images, of course. There was this man on the left there uh, named uh, George Herbert. He was the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. They often called Lord Carnarvon uh, as well, who was, by the way, obsessed with ancient Egypt, uh, been there many times. And they think he hired a Howard Carter around, I want to say, 1907 to excavate in the Valley of the Kings to possibly find King Tut's tomb. And so he was the main financial backer uh, that you know, allowed Carter to do this. Uh, and uh, there, of course, uh, is an image of uh, King, King Tut's uh, mummy right there. Uh, which they found, of course, the tomb uh, in November 1922. They actually found a staircase that went down to where uh, the tomb is, which the tomb, by the way, is, I think, called KV-62. Uh, his last tomb, of course, found uh, in, in the Valley of the Kings. And, of course, the mummy of King Tut uh, kind of colorized, this black and white picture they colorized, uh, which is right there. But it was a very small tomb, not very big. Uh, only had like four chambers uh, actually in it. Had this antechamber that went into an annex and then had a burial chamber uh, where King Tut's mommy was kept along with a huge treasury, which is really the most famous thing that was found, of course, was all of his treasures. And uh, they do think that King Tut's tomb had been broken into at one point, uh, but had been resealed. Uh, and uh, they theorize that part of why King Tut's tomb was not robbed was because apparently there was debris from some other tombs that were kind of above it, where it was falling down, and it covered where the main passageway or staircase that led to its entrance. So nobody knew about it. And so it's, it pretty much laid uncovered for several thousand years. Uh, there, of course, is an image of uh, King Tut's mummy, which is, of course, still kept in the tomb today. Uh, but the most famous thing they found, you know, with King Tut's uh, tomb was this famous death mask, the mask of King Tut uh, you see there on the left, uh, which is mostly made of, you know, it's like gold there, painted gold. Uh, and um, that depicts his tomb, of course, the paintings on the wall. They had that, and of course, the Book of the Dead was also painted uh, as well uh, in his tomb. Uh, that is his wife. Uh, he did have a wife. Uh, his, uh, his wife and queen was Aksana Moon, uh, who uh, was believed to be uh, one of the daughters. I think she's somehow related through Hatshepsut or something like that. They theorize. I think it's what it is. Yeah, not Hatshepsut. Through, uh, excuse me, Nefertiti, I think, or something like that is what it is. Uh, and um, they had two children, but... Um, they died right after they were born, or stillborn or whatever. And so because of the fact that they didn't have any children to pass the dynasty on to, uh, the thrones went to basically those other men, uh, ministers that were under uh, King Tut, which I told you, A, and Horemheb, who kind of controlled the, the empire for a while uh, until the 19th dynasty, of course, came in. Uh, yeah, they found three coffins uh, in his tomb, uh, which they were solid gold and wood. Uh, I think they each weighed like 200 pounds, just to kind of give you an idea of how you know valuable and how much wealth these pharaohs had uh, in, in ancient times. And here's another image showing like one of the golden coffins, of course, on the left, and of course the throne that he sat on uh, as, as well. Now, there's another story, too, uh, which I will talk about, which is kind of famous about King Tut. Uh, supposedly, after they went into the tomb, uh, 
they didn't really get into the tomb until 1923. Uh, what happened was several men that went into the tomb started dying afterwards. Uh, the most famous was Lord Carnarvon. He went into the tomb uh, several times, and then uh, next thing you know, he died of a, a infected mosquito bite. And so a lot of people, like in the newspapers, the media, uh, started saying that there was a curse on the tomb. And so that, that led to the famous curse of the mummy or the curse of the pharaohs, as they, as they sometimes called it afterwards. And some people thought that the pharaohs had either uh, put a curse on, on the actual uh, tomb of King Tut or booby-trapped it or something like that. But uh, they think that's all bunk. Uh, the all those kind of theories that uh, there may have been something in the tomb that caused people to become ill, uh, bacteria or whatever, uh, that may have been there for thousands of years. And then when oxygen came into the tomb, it probably reactivated whatever it was. That's possibly what could have caused them to get sick and die. We're not sure about that. Uh, but it did spawn a lot of mummies, like the mummy movies and things like that, that, that are kind of very famous today is kind of where that came from originally. So that's the story of King Tut's tomb, uh, the most famous thing uh, ever, of course, found in Egypt, that and the Rosetta Stone uh, as well. Let me also talk about uh, the later dynasties of the new king, the 19th and the 20th dynasties uh, that come in uh, as well. You see Ramses the Great, Ramses the Second, he's considered to be one of the greatest pharaohs uh, of course, of the New Kingdom. Uh, you see here, he was uh, mostly reign, reigned in the 13th century B.C. Uh, the son of King Seti I. Seti I was a pretty famous pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, and they also had a grandfather named Ramses I, who had founded, they think, the 19th dynasty uh, sometime at the beginning of the 13th century. Uh, and uh, they think he's uh, considered to be one of the greatest pharaohs, even probably of all of Egypt. He really stands out uh, as, you know, famous for a lot of different achievements uh, as pharaoh. But you can see he was also one of the longest reigning. Uh, they believe that Ramses reigned something like 66 years, I think, or something like that. That's how long uh, he was in power. Uh, and anyway, uh, they think that uh, his reign... Um, is often somehow connected with the Exodus story. I think there's some some theories that maybe Ramses the Great could have been the Pharaoh uh, that Moses, uh, you know, fought to uh, free the Israelites uh, in Egypt. Uh, but they're not sure if that's really true or not. Uh, he's been a lot of pharaohs of Egypt have been connected to the Exodus story, uh, but he's around so long, uh, Ramses the Great, that. Um, a lot of people in Egypt called him the great ancestor because of the fact that a lot of his relatives were pharaohs. I think a lot of the pharaohs later of the 20th dynasty or even somehow related to him or adopt his name. Uh, and uh, and then the Greeks, the Greeks also had a name for him, which of course was Ozymandias, is what they also called him as well. So he was known by different nicknames uh, from, from a long, long time ago. But well, he's really the, the, the you know the Pharaoh in the in the you know Exodus story in the Bible, Old Testament. They're not sure about that. In fact, the Bible doesn't even mention who the uh, Pharaoh's name is. So there's kind of a debate about whether it's him or some other Pharaoh. Moses lived the 13th century, quite possible, but uh, they don't really know uh, for sure. Now he is known for a lot of his building projects. Uh, that's probably the most impressive thing that's kind of left behind. Uh, from ancient times. Uh, one of his most famous is the uh, Temple of Ramses uh, at Abu Simbel, uh, which is in southern Egypt, which was constructed where now Lake Nasser is. And uh, this was a rock-cut temple uh, that was constructed by a lot of his workers uh, to honor not just his own reign, uh, but the god Ra, because you know Ra was becoming the god again that was kind of more important uh, with Amun, uh, and um, very egotistical ruler. Uh, he was known for constructing massive statues of himself uh, in Egypt. I think I've got another image showing here, uh, right here. Those statues, which there are four of them at one point that were in front 
of that rock cut sta- rock cut temple uh, were something like almost 70 feet tall. Uh, and there's even statues. There's actually a, a kind of a hypo style hall he cut out uh, on the inside of it, which has huge statues of himself uh, as well that are there. There's no statue on the left of him, but you'll find a lot of statues of Ramses the Great all over still modern Egypt. And um, there's the hypo style hall that he constructed in it. And then you can see at the end of the hall, there's actually this image, a uh, kind of a relief image that he built there, which represents him with the god Ra next to him. So they're kind of trying to have it illuminated, uh, of course, uh, and the importance of Ra. Now, there's another image of it. Uh, if you know about uh, that temple, they had to move it uh, in the 1960s. Uh, because of Aswan High Dam was being constructed. So that formed Lake Nasser. <clears throat> and so they actually had to move it up. So I think the actual temple was located down there where the water is now. Uh, so they cut it out and they moved it uh, to that location uh, that you're looking at right there. But it does include, uh, I think, several other temples that are right there uh, that he also built in the same location, which is in southern Egypt. Uh, above uh, above Sudan uh, today. Uh, he did also construct part of uh, the Karnak Temple Complex. That's a huge statue, by the way, of Ramses the Great on the left, which is in the uh, British Museum uh, in London. But you can see other statues on the right, uh, which are right there. Yeah, they have that hypo-style hall, which was the largest part of the uh, Karnak Temple Complex that was constructed in the, that that section was built by mostly two pharaohs, his father Seti the first, and Ramses the Great. And the statues I told you went up to like seventy feet tall. Uh, that's how big they were. And th- those those actual columns helped to uh, hold up the whole roof of that whole hall, which has these architraves that are kind of on top of it that have the roof on top of it. Uh, and so that was considered really a great feat uh, that was done, of course, under his reign. So there's the hypo style hall, and they filmed a lot of movies there too. I think the Mummy movies, and I think it's even a James Bond movie. I think they filmed there. Uh, that's kind of famous uh, at that location. Uh, there's another image of the hypo style hall uh, that you're looking at from another angle, uh, right there. So yeah, you can see how tall those columns were. Well, they were huge. So columns obviously went back to, you know, that time period of Egypt. Columns weren't, you think most people think that the Greeks, Romans invented columns, but they're around going back that far uh, to Egyptian times. I also uh, kind of mentioned her briefly, but Queen Nefertari, that was the main uh, wife uh, of, of Ramses the Great, uh, kind of, I guess his best love. Uh, and so she's considered pretty, also a very famous uh, queen of Egypt, and uh, that's her image on the right of uh, Nefert- Nefertari, uh, which I think that's a kind of a painting they did of her inside the uh, Abu Simbel temple I was telling you about, Ramses the Great Temple. Uh, they had six children uh, total together. Uh, they think Ramses at one point had like, I forget how many children it was, but he may have had something like a hundred children uh, with different women. Uh, I think he had 50 sons or more at one point. He had a lot of a lot of children. That's part of why he's called the great ancestor too, because of all the children that were born, I guess, that are related to him later in Egypt. So. Uh, also, there's another temple he constructed, which is called the Ramsium Temple, uh, which was a, a name that was coined by uh, Jean-Francois Champollion later uh, when he went to Egypt uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and um, that temple was a mortuary temple that he constructed in Western Thebes, like west of where Luxor is today. And it was constructed to, you know, bring his mummy there to be uh, mummified. And then also it was constructed to honor the god Osiris, uh, the, you know, the Egyptian god of the dead. Uh, and um, supposedly at that site, uh, there was a huge uh, statue of Ramses the Great that was built, uh, which I think they called it sometimes the colossal statue of Ramses, and it's actually been rebuilt. Uh, I think they're, you know about that, they're going to put it inside that that grand Egyptian uh, museum they're constructing right now. 
And I think the uh, actual statue was something like 30 feet tall. Uh, it was how, how tall it was, uh, or it may have been taller than that uh, at one point. And I think, I forget the weight on it, but it weighed like 80-something tons, uh, this huge statue. So he was known for building these huge statues uh, of himself uh, throughout Egypt. Now, they do have one last pharaoh they do come in that they have uh, in the 12th century B.C., Ramses III. They consider him to be one of the last great pharaohs. He's, a, he's one of the first one of the first rulers that reigns over the uh, 20th dynasty uh, that comes in the last dynasty of the new kingdom that they have. And uh, what happened under his reign was that Egypt got invaded in the 12th century B.C. If you remember correctly, I talked before about the Sea Peoples. Now they came in, they invaded the Mediterranean Sea. They attacked Turkey, they sacked the Hittites and destroyed their empire. And they pushed into like the Levant, like where Israel is. And they also attacked into Egypt uh, as well. Uh, but they think he was kind of a hero uh, as a pharaoh, drove them out of Egypt, uh, but they think it took a toll on Egypt afterwards. They had other pharaohs that would come in afterwards uh, that would reign, uh, but Egypt began to decline uh, between basically the 12th down to the 11th centuries. And they actually would end up having the other pharaohs that all came after uh, Ramsey III, they're all named Ramses, like Ramses III to Ramses XI are the pharaohs that pretty much reign uh, throughout, throughout the 20th dynasty, but like I said, Egypt really never recovered after that. Uh, you can see kind of the time periods of Egypt that kind of follow afterwards. Uh, there is kind of this third intermediate period, a uh, period of chaos uh, in Egypt, uh, where Egypt breaks up uh, and uh, they're invaded by different peoples. Uh, the late period is another period in Egypt uh, where they're occupied by other powers, uh, 7th century to the 4th century B.C., Ptolemaic Egypt, you can see uh, the Roman period uh, in Byzantine Egypt as well, uh, which follow also. But yeah, here's the uh, different people that occupied Egypt at one point. Uh, if you want to talk about the Nubians, but the Nubians in Kush or Sudan, uh, which was south of Egypt, actually came in. They took over Egypt uh, in 728 BC, and they became pharaohs of Egypt that ruled over it. Uh, the Assyrians took over Egypt in 671 B.C. The Assyrians would kind of control it for a short time, but they lost it. And then the Persians came in, seized power 525 B.C. They would hold it for about two centuries. And then what happened, 332 B.C., Alexander the Great uh, conquered Egypt and began building you know, the city of Alexandria, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and then the Roman period, the Romans would... Uh, come in later, they would uh, take over after the Ptolemaic kingdom would reign uh, to 30 BC. The Romans really ruled the longest, uh, probably during that period afterwards, uh, where they're around to like the seventh century at one point uh, in influence uh, over over Egypt. Uh, Arabs, like with the you know invasion, like the spread of Islam throughout the Middle East, uh, would of course take over Egypt around 640. And later, you have the Turks come in. The Ottoman Empire uh, would control Egypt uh, for about almost three centuries, uh, between the 16th and 19th centuries as well. And then you see the British. The British uh, also, of course, uh, will control Egypt, like really from the 19th century up through World War I, World War II, uh, the British kind of control a uh, good bit of Egypt. So Egypt itself doesn't really become an independent state, more or less, so really, like sometime, like especially after World War II, so you start like the republics of Egypt that you have uh, right now. So, yeah, Egypt, Egypt, you know, um, their legacy, they're trying to protect it. Uh, so, you know, they're working to prevent, you know, all this, you know, people stealing and looting their their you know, antiquities. And of course, you've seen, of course, I've talked about how they're trying to you know build that museum behind me, the uh, the Grand Egyptian Museum, of course, which might open this year. Uh, when it does open, it probably will be the largest museum in the world. It'll be the largest one, like ever built. Uh, period. So I guess that'll be quite a quite a grand opening when it, of course, does come open. So a uh, few things before I go. That's pretty much going to wrap up my lectures, of course, on Egypt. I did want to talk about a few things, of course, before I go. 
Uh, here, of course, is a little announcement I've got uh, on the first exam, which I haven't posted that yet, but that will be upcoming, uh, which I think I'm going to post the exam on Wednesday uh, is when I'm going to do it. 10 a.m. Uh, is when it'll be posted. Uh, between then and there, of course, I am going to be uh, posting um, like a review, like a first exam review uh, that I'm going to have, uh, which I'll try to post that either today or tomorrow for y'all to kind of start you're reviewing for for the exam that's coming coming up because uh, uh, it is going to be a tougher tougher assessment. So compared to you know the quizzes you've been doing, uh, I think it's going to be kind of a combination of like multiple choice uh, matching. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of also um, fill in the blank type uh, short answer questions you'll have to do uh, as as well uh, for that for that assessment. Uh, and so I'll have a, a kind of a recorded review where I'll kind of go over the main study guide questions you need to kind of look at uh, to help prepare uh, for that for that assignment. So I'll probably try to post either today or tomorrow. I'm still kind of working on it uh, right now. I've pretty much finished the exam, uh, but I kind of I've kind of going to wrap that up uh, pretty much for y'all. So that's it. Uh, I don't think I've got too many other students, I guess, that have. Uh, I know it looks like uh, Kelsey had joined us earlier. Hey, hey, what's up, Kelsey? Kelsey, and there's also Samantha also is joining us uh, as well. So if you got a comment, question, of course, about this lecture uh, or any of my other lectures, of course, you can leave comments, of course, on my channel uh, or also, of course, also don't forget uh, in, in Canvas discussions. Uh, if you got a question, of course, about the class, uh, do let me know. Of course, you can always email me, of course. Everybody's got my email address pretty much. That's it for the week. Yeah, no lecture plan for Wednesday. Of course, I will have, like I said, a recorded review coming up. Of course, that'll be kind of our, I guess, our lecture or whatever uh, for the week. But I'll try to post that either today or tomorrow uh, towards Wednesday when I post, of course, uh, the upcoming first exam. So that's it for, for the week. Kind of a short week for us, I guess, <laughs> lecture-wise. Uh, but y'all take care, uh, and I'll see y'all, of course, uh, later.